What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. This is PPR podcast number 180. This will be the week one review show and the week two preview show. As always, I'm Chase Isidoro, and as always, I'm joined by Maddie Worley. Maddie, back again on the podcast. Yes, happy to be back for our second round. Um, we had a lot of action as it was week one of the prep football season, but one of the biggest games was actually on Saturday. Chase, you were there yeah. filming at all. Tell us what you saw at Lincoln and Arbor View. Yeah, honestly, I think with the Lincoln Arbor View, obviously Lincoln lost the game 45-44. I think one of the biggest things I noticed from that game is kind of what happens to a lot of really great teams, which is you feel comfortable, you feel confidence in yourself, which is something you should have if you want to be a great right. team. But then a team you go up against just does everything right. And I don't think Arbor View really did anything flashy or anything like they looked like they were dominating them. They just knew where to sit down in the zones, knew how to break down the man coverage, and it just worked out that way. You know, that with a first drive interception by Achilles Smith Jr., that leads up to them going down, making it 14-0. And then Arbor View gets the onside kick later as well. So then they're chasing from the rest of the game. And so, you know, myself, and I don't know his name, I was talking to a man on the sideline who was a Lincoln fan, but we were just sitting there going, man, they just need to get into halftime so these coaches can talk to them and then they'll come out on fire, which is what happened. But really what I was impressed by was the halftime talk. Now, I didn't plan on sitting next to the Lincoln <laughs> sideline. I was just going to get my water and sit in the shade, but I was sitting next to their huddle because they didn't go into the locker room. They stayed right out there on the field. And I heard exactly what those coaches said. Now, I'm not going to repeat it, not because <laughs> it's not suitable for the podcast, some words maybe, but really that's none of our business. You know, what's I'm uh, a journalist, but I'm also a football player. And I know that that stuff is kind of between the team and I kind of leave it at that. But what I did here was exactly what I would want to hear if I was a player and showed me that those are the guys you would want to play for in those coaches. They ripped into them, but not ripped into them to the, like, for the sake of ripping into them. They were just telling them what it is and being straight with them with what they saw in their performance. And it really lit a fire under them in, in the third quarter. They came out on fire, drive after drive after drive. You know, obviously the big thing was Achilles Smith Jr., 371 yards. I made it actually an error on my Twitter post. I said four touchdowns, excuse me, he had five touchdowns because he had his rushing touchdown in the first half as well. But four passing touchdowns, all of them going to, to Ty Olson, who had 300 receiving yards on 12 receptions. It was an incredible yes. performance, but really, with what stood out to me was the defense because that was the issue was in the first half. They couldn't find a way to stop them. Now there were some situations, obviously like we talked before, where I think there was one where they had they could have gone to fourth down, it would have been a long field goal try, but then Lincoln said, all right, we'll accept the penalty to push them back even further on third, and they scored a deep touchdown on that one. So it's kind of just everything went wrong in that aspect. But really they turned it up in the second half. I thought Nico Ta, the quarterback, turn safety. I know he played a little bit there last year. He was phenomenal in this game, flying around the ball. There was also the freshman, Prince Tavizon. I'm sorry if I mispronounced his last name. I'm sure we're going to figure it out because, I mean, he was all over the place as well, rushing off the edge. He looked incredible. Dylan Dunn at the middle linebacker spot. I thought he was flying around great. But really the big plays came from Abdullah Sharif two big interceptions when they needed it. I believe one was out for the drive. Lincoln like scored on every single drive in the second half. And then on one of the drives where they didn't, and it was like, oh man, that might be the game. Sharif got a pick. And I think he did, he got another interception earlier. So it was just the Lincoln defense, which has really been their calling card of like, where well, you're not gonna stop us because of our defense. They really turned it up in the second half. And I know the big the big names will be Achille and Ty Olsen for what they did, obviously, offensively. But that defense, if they didn't have that, I mean, our review, would have, it would have never been this close. It's a shame that they couldn't pick up, pick up the, um, the comeback and they couldn't pull it off. Not a shame because we look at Lincoln as, well, why couldn't you have done it against our review? It was a shame because it was the perfect halftime speech. And for that coach's staff to do that with their kids and then for the kids to actually pull it off, I think that would have been the perfect way to cap off that game. And they honestly, they deserved it. Now, our review, I, I don't think they did anything wrong. I, they hats off to them. They played a great game against Lincoln. But I think, man, if there was a way to pull that one off and like really solidify what the coaches were trying to tell, I wish they would have got the comeback. But, you know, little, very little silver linings in football. You know, at the end of the day, you can play a great game like that, but at the end of the day, a loss is a loss. But if there is a silver lining, it's that they listen to the coaches. And I would I would be worried if I was the week two opponent for Lincoln, because I think they're going to come out on fire in their next game. I 100% agree that 
like you said, after the coach's speech, after coming so close and just barely missing that win, week two, they're going to come out guns blazing, ready to go. And I agree, I would be scared if I was their opponent. Yeah, and I don't have much worries about them as well, because I think that's probably the first thing people would react is like, well, they lost. Are, are they still the same team? I think so. You know, I think it is more or less the same group from last year, but it is a different group as well. You know, anytime you lose your seniors, you got to have some different changes when it comes to leadership positions. So I do think they're going to catch on pretty quickly. And, you know, sometimes it just takes getting punched in the mouth to wake you up, especially when you think you're the top dog. And I think they got punched in the mouth and already responded. Didn't pull off the win, but they're ready to go. I would be scared of Lincoln going forward, <laughs> um, especially what Ty Olson did. I mean, 12 catches for 300 yards, four touchdowns. He was burning them down deep. It wasn't like just little by little by little. I mean, he had a couple, like 60 yarders at a time. I mean, it was incredible. It's incredible to see him work with Akili, and it could show that how much they've worked in the offseason because Akili was looking his way almost every single play. He was looking for, all right, Ty's going to get us down there, and he did. So hats off to them. I can't wait to see them in the week two. But, I mean, I might as well start getting into week two. Who do we got for game of the week? So week two, game of the week, we've got Torrey Pines visiting La Jolla. Last week, Torrey Pines was quite far across the country over in Pennsylvania. However, they're still back home looking for their first win after falling to freedom out in Bethlehem. And they will be taking on La Jolla, who did get their first win over Bishops in the Battle of Pearl Street. You know, a really impressive win because this Bishops team, I'm really high on them. I think Bishops has a really solid team. So, I mean, 38-21 against your rival, that's a really, really good game. Hudson Smith for La Jolla looks like the real deal. Uh, he, he had a phenomenal game. And it's a really, it's a returning unit of players that all know how to work together. And it showed. They looked ready to go. Um, Carson Deal as well, another big interception. And I might have two or one. I I have to check the stats on that, but I know he had the big one at the end. And Carson Deal, I, I think he's a phenomenal defensive player. Torrey Pines, you know, when Scott Ashby took over for them, it really changed. Um, and I think they really went on to a direction where they're like on the ascendancy. I know they lost a lot of guys from this last year. One of the players that I did get to see was Reese Morgan at quarterback. I thought he was solid. Still probably a little raw in his abilities, but I think he is going to be a very good quarterback. And I think Torrey Pines can do some great things with them. As we know, also Torrey Pines loves to run the ball. I believe both their touchdowns in that game against uh, Freedom were from running it in. Mm -hmm. So a hard-nosed running team going against really and an air it out team but but has carolina at running back so you know they can go kind of for anything with la jolla i would probably favor la jolla and i think honestly we need to start ranking la jolla as a top 10 team in this county they're that good Torrey Pines always been a D1 team, so you, you know when when these teams match up, you never know what you're truly going to get. I do think La Jolla will be a tough one for Torrey Pines, just because I think Torrey Pines is still settling in. You know, it's hard to see though because we don't have the film footage from them True. from week one. So Torrey Pines might be ready to go as well, but I think La Jolla is really on the ascendancy when it comes to one of the top teams in this county, and I think they can really do some great things, especially with what Hudson Smith's done at quarterback. Yeah, I was very impressed with what I saw from La Jolla this last week. And so I think, you know, Torrey Pines is still looking for a win to early on in the season. And like you said, they're always a Division One program. We shouldn't count them out. But La Jolla is asserting themselves as someone to be in that top 10 conversation. So it's going to be a great matchup this week. And then down in the South Bay, we've got Granite Hills visiting Modern Day. Granite last week took the win over Mission Hills, 28 to 17. And I mean, they killed it out there. Let's talk about Maxwell Turner, along with the Eagle defense showing up after we talked last week with a loss of their core group. They're still proving themselves that Granite Hills is gonna be Granite Hills. Yeah, and I think that just shows what the program is now. It's, they are building themselves into a great unit. Considering how many guys they lost, they still play great defense against one of the better offenses in the county in Mission Hills. Um, guys that are stacked with Giovanni Hart and obviously Troy Hune as well. I mean, Max Turner, when we talked about, all right, what is it going to look like now without the splitting time with Pablo? I mean, you, you go out there and that's exactly what you want a every down running back to be. 27 carries, 203 yards, three touchdowns. Brandon Lewis also operating as the main wide receiver once again. Uh, he had eight for 98. Uh, this Eagles offense is going to be great. 
this Eagles offense is going to be able to take down anybody. I, I truly believe that still. Um, modern day, I, I do need to see a little bit more from. They did have some, I'm not going to call them fluke plays because any plays that happen on a Friday night are great plays, but the tip, the tip tail Mary that they caught in the end zone, the kickoff return for a touchdown, it's hard to you know, to replicate those type of plays, especially when it came out to a 56 to 28 scoreline against Cathedral. I think the biggest thing you have to look for is that they let up 335 rushing yards in week one to the Dons. Now, there's no shame in that because of how big Cathedral is on the line. And also, it's the Dons. They're always going to run the ball like that. But when you're going against a guy like Maxwell Turner, and Granite Hills has a solid O-line as well, you got to be ready to come in the, in the trenches. I thought Cartel Purvis had a pretty solid day, though. 10 of 13, 220 yards, three touchdown. Isaiah Cook is really starting to show as being, like, the guy on modern day's team. So, you know, 147 total yards. He's a great athlete, great player. This is going to be a big test for modern day, and I think it's going to be a big test to show just what type of team they are. I still think they're the powerhouse down south, but we need to see what they're at. Because obviously, you go against Cathedral, it's a test It's a test to see how big you are, how great you can be. It's another test against Granite Hills again. So can you hang with them? Can you pull off the win? I mean, you are at home, but can you pull off the win? That will be the big question for modern day as far as where they're going to go in this season. Yeah, it's a tough first two weeks for Modern Day, I would say. They're facing some of the strongest opponents in the county. So win or loss, I do think this will make them stronger. This will get them into their groove. But um, it's going to be it's going to be a good game. I'm interested in seeing what they're going to do to kind of fix the mistakes that they maybe had in week one yeah. against a similar opponent. Yeah, definitely. That team that's going to run the ball a lot, big in the trenches, in and, you know, it's a new group at Modern Day as well. So they're still figuring it out and they've got a really tough schedule. So this is a testing point for them. So, you know, I think there is good, like I said, silver linings. Unless you get the W, silver linings nobody cares for in football. But I think there needs to be some growth and there needs to be some like, all right, this is how we can test ourselves against the best. Because Modern Day has always shown that they can in the past, but now it's a new era. So they have to, you know, go out there and rebuild themselves again. True. And then some other teams that are testing themselves against the best. We've got Oceanside visiting Santa Fe Christian. Obviously, Oceanside is just a historic program here in the county. And Santa Fe Christian, you know, they're coming off a win from a team uh, from San Luis Obispo. So they're excited. But I'm interested in seeing how they're going to look against Oceanside, as Oceanside also is another team with some big guys in the trenches. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in seeing what their offense is going to do. I think they had like two guys over 300 pounds in the yeah. trenches, something like that. I, I forget what it was, the stat in the PPR preview we did, but they had, they're really big in the trenches. Obviously, Isaiah Tokyo is well coming over. I don't know if he'll be suiting up for this one or not. Um, but Oceanside coming off the first loss. I love what Fale Pumele has done taking over that program. I think they are one of the teams that is rising in this county. Santa Fe Christian, a big game for them for the sense of they're playing under the lights. You know, they play at that small field that's basically attached to their baseball field. All their games are during the day. I believe this one's at Torrey Pines. And they'll be able to have that Friday night lights feel, which every single kid deserves to have, regardless of what school they play at. So big moment for them. I think it'll be a tough test to go against an Oceanside program, an Oceanside team that looks really, really good. But I think with that energy, and obviously, as we've seen in the past, Santa Fe Christian rises up to the moment. You know, it's a smaller school, sure, but they do have athletes. They, the way they play can be devastating to teams. I think Santa Fe Christian... In that moment where they get the Friday Night Lights game, I do think they have a chance to pull it off. But I think Oceanside, first loss against a really tough opponent. They now come back to town. I think they have a, a lot of momentum to go out there and win this one. I agree. I think both teams have momentum coming into this game, and it's going to be a good matchup. I'm interested to see what happened, but I don't think I'm ready to totally count out either one. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to that game. And speaking of momentum, two teams that are off to a great start at 1-0 each. East County Game of the Week, Scripps Ranch at El Cap. Both of them 1-0. Scripps Ranch beating San Pasquale 42-27. El Cap, big win over Mira Mesa, 21-14. The one that stood out for me for Scripps Ranch was Ryan Standhair, massive game, four total touchdowns, including one of them where he was on the kick team for the field goal. It got blocked. He scooped it up and went to the house for a touchdown. That was incredible. But also the big play of the week was Bruin Ford on the strip interception fumble. It's hard to look at it when it was ruled, but he takes it to the house to win against Mira Mesa. 
these are two programs that you know we kind of always know can be great at times. So when I'm looking at this, one, can Scripps Ranch replicate the run, run offense that they had in week one? If they can, man, they're going to be really, really tough to stop. El Cap, what do we get from Brant Barker? Because I think last year, obviously, he put up incredible numbers, and it looks like he has Aiden Benegas as his number one wide receiver, nine catches for 107 yards in week one. I think Brant can take over a game when he's on, on his game, and I think he makes it really difficult for teams to stop him. But I think when it comes to running the ball, that's more how I lean when it comes to high school football. And if you have a guy that's running like Ryan Stanhill did in week one, it'll be really tough to stop Scripps Ranch. But this, honestly, I mean, I, I get it. <laughs> game of the week is Torrey Pines La Jolla. This one might honestly be game of the week. But I think, we're, I think we've had enough of stealing game of the weeks from Allison. I feel like she never gets to see the great matchups because it's always like Grant Hills is playing Helix. It's like, all right, that's not East County. That's, that's, that's game of the week. Game. So at least she gets this one, which is uh, going to be a phenomenal game. Yeah, Allison has a big week ahead of her. I think that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure she's excited to be getting one of the great ones of the week. And I think both teams a little bit this last week surprised me. I was really pleasantly surprised to see how well their offense came out. Like you said, Scripps Ranch, the run game is going to be very difficult to stop. And I'm interested in seeing what the pass game is going to look like for El Cap with Brant Barker and Aiden Benegas. So I think it's going to be a really fun and I think it'll be an action-packed matchup. Yeah, I agree. I, I wouldn't be surprised if this one's one of the higher scoring ones of the week. Um, so I'm always signed up for that one, so definitely. Now, the city game of the week, we have Steel Canyon 1-0 off their big win over Ramona at the Madhouse, taking on Madison, who fell to 1-0. I mean, sorry, fell to 0-1 after losing to Foothill from Santa Ana. I was at that game. We had the young sophomore quarterback, Isaac Diaz, starting for Madison. And to be honest, he looked okay. It wasn't the greatest game out there, um, you know, kind of thrown into that position. He looked like he had a lot, of, a lot of physical attributes that looked really great, but then there was times where it's like kind of welcome to varsity moments where he rolled out to his left, you know, looked for guys that were open, looked for guys that were open, and that moment where you should throw the ball away, he just froze, and then the ball got stripped and it was a fumble. Big change in the game. You know, there was a couple big moments like that that happened with him that honestly, Madison would probably be one to know against a pretty solid Foothill team. They were pretty big as well. Um, I still like what Madison has. I think Ryan Jackson played great. He had tipped the ball to himself and caught for a touchdown. Um, I think Madison's gonna have a decent year, but I think it will come down to Diaz at quarterback. How fast can he get up to speed when it comes to the varsity level? I think he'll look back at all the mistakes he had in week one and be like, all right, I, I kind of now know, maybe play it a little safer. Um, and I think if they do that, this Madison team will be really, really solid. I don't know how high they can go. I don't know if they're necessarily an open team. Um, I think they might be in that D1, D2 level because now the playoffs will shift. But I do think they are capable. And I do think they're still a really, really solid team. Going against Steel Canyon, we didn't have any footage on them, but obviously Nico Jara coming off last year, incredible on special teams, really good wide receiver as well. I mean, they put up a lot of points on Ramona. I, I, I would be, this is really a big test for them to see what kind of team Steel Canyon can be and how can they match up against a Madison team that's gonna be hungry to get their first win. I like this matchup a lot for City Game of the Week. I do too. I think I'm excited to see Nico Jara, like you said, running the ball, see what he's gonna keep doing on special teams. Always an impressive player. But Madison is a team to me that has room to grow. And I think later on in the season, maybe even next year, is when we might see them really making some strides. But like you said, it could happen now. It could happen really soon. And that's something we all need to watch. Yeah, definitely. You know, I'm trying to think of like biggest takeaways from week one, because from week one, it always is so tough because it's either it's like, all right, it's a blowout or we got a really close game. I feel like there's a lot more blowouts in there. I think the biggest takeaway was how Patrick Henry went out there and put up 77 points. Um, they were phenomenal. Cody Capaletti had an incredible game. I don't know. I, after week one, though, I don't have like a takeaway as far as like, all right, these are the top dogs now. I do think it's a lot closer. I do think. And honestly, I don't know if I'll do any or will do any top 10 rankings until after September 26th when most of those guys come back. Because it's so hard to judge like, all right, that Cathedral team put up that much points on modern day, but they're also missing like five guys. Um, you know, it's so hard to judge with a lot of the guys around the county like that. So it's very weird stage after week one. I think that's my biggest takeaway is like, it feels like we don't actually know 
as much as we should right now. But I, you know, I'm, I'm ready for week two. I think now that we're in the second part of the show now, that first week, everyone's nervous. Everyone's just trying to get ready to go. Now it's week two. It's a little bit more settled in. And I think guys are going to be ready for um, some more closer action than week one was. I think so. Yeah, week one, there was a lot of blowouts. And I think with the new playoff setup and divisions, it's a little hairy right now. We don't totally know who's going to be where. But now the dust is shaken off. The nerves hopefully are starting to leave all the athletes. And I think we're going to start seeing who's really here to get the job done in week two, week three. Maybe we'll know a little more after that September 26th with all the transfers. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And I will say a shout out for teams that did play a close game because they always do. And we have to thank them for it. Thank you, Rancho Bernardo and Poway for continuing to be Rancho Bernardo and Poway, a 13-10 game. I, I asked Bo, I was like, yeah, it was a close game from uh, RB and Poway. He was like, what was it, like 10-7? He turned around and saw the board, he's like 13-10. Yep, so you know, it's very predictable when those two teams match up. So at least we had a very, very close one in that. But that'll do us for this week's edition of the podcast. As always, we'll see you guys on Friday night. See you Friday.